Thank you, Scott. Scott's our worship leader here at uh, Springdale. And uh, in case you're kind of tempted to steal him, he's just really out on, uh, on parole right now. We, uh, he's got a little tether on him, so I don't think you would want him if you're uh, at all uh, interested in that. Now, we appreciate his gifts and abilities. Hey, thanks for coming this morning. We're glad that you're here. I hope that you're enjoying the, uh, the, the few days that you've had here, as I have, learning from uh, various uh, presenters and uh, meeting some vendors who will be influential in helping us in our ministries. It's always uh, great to work with, with Larry Morris and his team. Thank you for that and uh, the abilities that uh, you have and you bring to the church uh, to help strengthen our local church. In fact, show your appreciation to Larry, if you would, and what they do to help us in our local environments. I want to talk to you today about your molten moment. Uh, now, I'm not talking about the Chili's molten chocolate cake, although I highly recommend this thing. It's very low calorie, about 200 or 2,000 calories, but uh, it'll be worth your time. There's one over at Tri-County in case you want one after lunch today. Uh, but it's not that molten moment. Uh, moment. Uh, McKeesport, Pennsylvania was once famous for their mills. They had steel rolling mills that were the world's largest. And at these mills, they would, um, they would make these tubes that were completely seamless. And what would happen is they would pour that molten into these forms and and they would go into a machine, and through centripetal force, it would spin those, that, or that molten, and it would cause the pipe to open up from the inside out, causing a perfect tube that was seamless. What I'm told is that the process that makes it work is the temperature has to be just right. If it's too hot, when it's being spun, it will just fall apart. If it's too cold, it won't open up as it should. And that perfect moment is called the molten moment. When everything fits just right, everything is the perfect temperature, it's called the molten moment. I'd like to suggest to you today that each of us have our perfect moments. We have our molten moments, if you would, that are spiritual of nature. I've, I've been listening this week, and I've heard some of your molten moments, for instance. Leslie Hart was, was uh, in third grade when her pastor spent some time with her third grade class, and Leslie gave her heart to the Lord in just the third grade. Today, she's a leader in the Church of the Nazarene, but it all happened because of her molten moment in the third grade. I, I listened on uh, Tuesday night to Lamoris Crawford talk about his molten moment when his cousin led him to Jesus Christ. And it changed not only his life, but as you heard, it's changed the life for his kids and it will change the lives for his grandkids. Everything changed in his molten moment. LaRonda had her molten moment when Mark Bain knocked on her door and led her to Christ. And, and her molten moment not just changed her life, but it's changing her whole community. General Superintendent Dr. Chombo, who will speak later this morning. Uh, he had his ministry confirmed by God when he was 17 years of age when he was at a youth camp. Today, he's a leader in the Church of the Nazarene, but his molten moment happened when he was just 17 years of age. In Romans chapter 12, you're familiar with the passage. It just reads like this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I like the translation that says, this is your reasonable act of service. Some of you remember that. I like that because the word reasonable in the Greek gives us the English word logic. In other words, it's just, it's just logical that we would worship God. It's just, it's just reasonable. It just makes sense that we would gather the children on a Sunday morning and bring them to church. It makes sense that we would disciple people. It makes sense that we would give of our time and our resources and our gifts. It, it's just logical to put God first in everything that we do. I've always been a, a child of the church. My grandfather was a Pilgrim Holiness minister, but when I came around, I was, I was five of six children, 
And when I came around, my, my parents had gone to the Nazarene church. So I've been in the Nazarene church all my life. My mom sang. She played the piano. She was the missionary president. She was the SAM director. Anybody remember that? Senior Adult Ministries Director. My dad was a board member. Um, he was in charge of all the buildings and grounds. There were five boys in my family, so Saturdays involved going to the church and spending our entire day washing the buses, mowing lawns. We had nine acres of property to mow every Saturday with little simplicity lawnmowers that were junk. That's what we did. Always been part of the church. I've loved the church. My parents never had to force me to go to church. That's not true of my brothers, but, but for me, I, I just enjoy being there. I love my pastors. I love to watch them. I love to listen to them. Reverend Quanstrom, and Reverend Burton, Reverend Snow, Reverend Barnhart. I admired them. I sat in the front row as a child. I always sat in the front row. I like to listen to them preach. As a child, their, their voice to me sounded like what God's voice would sound like. I love to drive by the church. I love to walk around the church. I like to be in the church. Even when I'm by myself. How many, of you, how, how many of you know that a church can be really creepy at night by yourself? It always surprised me. It doesn't matter what church I've ever attended. You know, Sunday morning, the Spirit of God came and the presence was so real. And, and it happens again Sunday night. It's just a beautiful time of God's presence. And you shut the lights off in the sanctuary to go to your office as you're leaving. And and the hairs on your arms stand up and you feel like demons are coming out from under the pews. I mean, it's just, it's the creepiest thing. But I've always loved the church. I like the sidewalks and the doors. I love the sanctuary. I love the music of the church. All of it. New, old, I love the people of the church. I love the choir and those who serve and those who teach. Anything that reminds me of the church, it moves me because, well, because I've just always loved the church. And it grieves me today when I hear people say that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You've heard it before. And I suppose, theologically, that's probably right. But my question would be, if you are a Christian, why would you not want to be in the church? I had a guy one time, he was saying, you know, well, you don't have to be a, a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I said, I said, no, why not? He said, well, it's just a place. It's, it's just a building. And I said, well, a hospital is just a place. If you get sick, you go there, don't you? Your job is just a place. Try not going to work for a week without calling in and see if they're going to pay you, right? The church is, is more than a place. The, the church is where God shows up. The church is where two or three are gathered and they're agreeing in my name. He, he meets with us. The church is where, well, the Bible says how good and pleasant it is when God's people gather together in unity. Better is one day in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. I love the church. And it, and it grieves me when I, when I look, at the, look at the attendance and when I look at what's happening and around the world, really, when it comes to church attendance, and, and it grieves me, and it just seems to be in decline. I don't know the answer. I, I wonder what, what would happen if the church started to grow. I, I wonder what is keeping the church from growing. I, I know we're trying to discover that this week. I've heard some answers. You probably have some answers to it. I I would say this, regardless of what you think should happen, we ought to begin with prayer. Don't you, don't you agree with that? John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray 
after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. I like that. A few years ago, I started asking God to give me some, some molten moments, some, some opportunities where I can share my faith with people at just the right time. You know, if you give a word or a message at just the right time, God can change somebody's life for all of eternity. The right word at the right time. And so I started praying and asking God for that and, 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 and asking him to give me opportunities where, well, he put me in the place of most potential. He put me next door to Ken and Samantha. Ken and Samantha were a young couple. They were Baptists, went to a large Baptist church in our town. Eventually, they had children. My, my girls began to, to babysit for them. Ken was a salesman for Porter Paints, and so he would travel from time to time. I, I always knew when he was out of town because his lawn would grow a little bit too high. And I had a riding mower, and so when he was gone, I would just zip through and I would mow his lawn, and I never said anything about it. As far as I can remember, he never said anything to me about it until one day I was coming home from work, and he was coming home at the same time, and he motioned for me to come on over. And so I went over there, and we began to chat about a few things. And, and then he said this. He said, hey, by the way, you're going to have some visitors at your, your church this Sunday. And I said, oh, yeah, who's that? He said, well, there's a new couple that just moved here. He just started to work for us. And they're from out of town. I told him they need to find a church. And he was a little skeptical, but he said, okay. And I told him where your church was. They're going to be there Sunday. I said, well, that's good. I said, but Ken, why didn't you invite him to your church? And he smiled and he said, because my pastor has never mowed my lawn before. <laughs> and so Ken sends over Brenda and Carl. And Brenda's a Christian, but Carl is not. But within three months' time, God opens up this door and creates this molten moment for me and for Carl. And, and Carl gave his heart to the Lord in my office just three months after attending the church. Now, that molten moment that we experienced really began back a few months earlier when, when I'm just mowing his lawn. But God's creating these things along the way, amen? Last December, it was nine degrees here in Ohio. I was coming back from Mount Vernon, and I was just south of Sydney, Ohio, on I-75. And I saw a work truck or work van that was on the side of the road. And there was a guy up ahead of that with just work boots, jeans, a Carhartt jacket, no gloves, no hat, and carrying a one-gallon gas tank, a gas can. And I quickly turned my blinker on. I pulled over. And I rolled the window down, but before it even went down, he just jumped in my car. <laughs> I was going to ask him if he needed a ride, but he just jumped in my car. And I said, it looks like you need gas. And he said, you know, he said, my gas gauge doesn't work on my van. And he said, so I keep track of the mileage. And according to my figures, I, I still had seven more miles to go. He said. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm working with, okay? Just... I stuck my hand out, and I said, my name's Daryl. And he said, my name's Daryl. And apparently he was a Bob Newhart fan, so he started in with all the jokes, Larry, Daryl, and Daryl stuff. And we chatted a little bit, found out that he owns this company. He got it from his dad. It was a heating and cooling company. I drove four miles to the nearest exit. We got him gas in this one-gallon can, and he said, oh, I can find a ride back, I think. I said, I'll just take you back. So I went back north again, turned around, went south, pulled over. And as he's getting ready to get out, he pulls his wallet out and gets a $20 bill, and he tries to give it to me. Now, I had not thought what I would say or wouldn't say. I just, I've been praying for molten moments, though. And he tried to give me a $20 bill, and I said, uh, I said, no, I don't want that. He said, well, no, I want to give you something. Now, I've never said this in my life. I've never said it since. Don't really know where it came from, except that I've been praying for molten moments and, and just felt like God told me to say this. And so I said, well, I said, if you want to do something for me, I said, I'm a Christian. 
And the next time you hear somebody badmouth a Christian, you just tell them that you met a Christian one time who helped you out when you were in a bad spot. Now, I know that doesn't sound very spiritual. It doesn't sound very pastorly. I mean, you'd think I would have thrown off some scriptures or something like that, but it's all I felt led to do in that moment. And he said, okay, I'll do that. He asked for a business card. I didn't have one. I gave him my number. And the following Tuesday, I get a call. I know it was Tuesday because it was my birthday. January 2nd, he called. He said, uh, I, I didn't recognize the number. I picked up the phone and I said, hello. He says, Daryl? I said, yes. He said, this is Daryl. And he started to laugh again. <laughs> I'm the guy you picked up and helped you out with the gas. I said, yes, I remember you. How are you doing? Well, fine. Thank you again, and so on. And then he says this. He said, I just want you to know that last Sunday, I went to church, and I met a whole bunch of nice Christians. Now, I don't, I don't know if he's given his heart to the Lord since. We had a conversation. I said, just keep on going. You keep meeting people. And, and, but I have, I have confidence in the Spirit that he'll just be pesty. And what he has begun, he will complete. And his ultimate molten moment started when he just forgot to put some gas in his car. But God orchestrated some things that way. A few years ago, Kevin Johnson, a pastor here for Connections, was sitting up on the balcony right up here with you two sinners that are up there. I see you up there. <laughs> nice of you to join us today. He was sitting right up there, so be careful what he might say to you today, just by the way. And uh, we had a missionary service, and the missionary said, if you could do anything and not fail, what would it be? And for whatever reason, that, that statement just really spoke to Kevin. He was serving here. He had a good position and doing a great job, and, and he and I began to talk about that. And for a year, we went through this process, and that, that statement just kept nagging at him until he got to the place where he said, I feel God calling me to leave this and, and to go become a school teacher. And so he moved. He packed up his family. He moved without a job. He moved to the East Coast, got a job in the inner city teaching high school students. He's had at least one student that's been killed this past year. But he's loving what God is having him do right now. His molten moment came because a missionary just said some words that he didn't know would stick, but apparently stuck in somebody's heart and mind. Last week, we have a, we have a campus that's about seven, seven, ten miles from here. It's a Norwood campus, and, and uh, we started a little pantry. And, and it, when I say that, it's a crude pantry. We have a good pantry here that... that uh, we serve about a thousand people a month but this is just a pantry because some folks in the church said you know we have people around the community and they could use some things once in a while and maybe we should just set some stuff up here so they they literally just bought a, a little shelf and some folks started bringing some things in well there's no marketing there's no name for this pantry it's just just some food there okay last saturday a guy came in and needed some, some groceries, and so they gave him some groceries. And as he was walking out, Pastor Rob, our campus pastor, was walking in, and this man just had a big smile on his face. He had these, this bag of groceries, and, uh, and he says to Pastor Rob, thanks so much. And Rob said, hey, no problem. He said, you know, we're just trying to help people out when we can. And, and then he got real serious, and he said, no, you don't understand. He said, it has been 10 years since I've had a box of Captain Crunch. <laughs> and we laughed. It's been 10 years since he had a box of Captain Crunch. But you know what? Wouldn't it be like God to use a box of Captain Crunch to soften a heart of a man who needs Jesus? Wouldn't it be like God to use a box of Captain Crunch for somebody's molten moment? What I'm telling you is this stuff can happen anywhere. Apparently, throwing a little bit of the fruit of the Spirit on someone can really make a difference. Could God use a little kindness, 
or a little generosity to draw somebody to, to him, to change the, their destiny for them. Each of us can do this, offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, allowing God to speak through us. It just makes sense. It's just logical. I like that first part of Romans 12 in view of God's mercy. Have you considered that lately? Have you considered the mercies of God? What, what are the mercies of God? Well, we're justified by faith. Yes. We've been saved of our sins. We've been adopted into the family of God. We've been sanctified. He works all things for our good. He doesn't count our sins against us. Amen. That's mercy. Because of his mercy, we all come in here at the same level. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's because of his mercy. When you come into church, you can't come in with your nose up in the air acting like you've never done anything wrong. Hello? You know you've done wrong. God knows you've done wrong. Satan knows you've done wrong. Every day he goes before the Father and accuses you. But, but Jesus stands up and says, wait a minute, I know he done that. But I went to the cross for that. I shed my blood for that. Therefore, now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's mercy. And it's because of his mercy that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Because of his mercy... We've been, we deserve punishment. We deserve hell. But God, on Good Friday, Jesus died for our sins and accepts us because of his mercy. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies. Live in a way that will attract people to Christ. Don't miss your molten moments. The right thing said at the right time can change the course of someone's life. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul said it. He says this, Don't you know that your life is a letter that everybody is reading? Now think about that just for a moment. The greatest teaching that you will ever do is not done with your words but with your life. Don't you know that your life is a letter that everyone is reading? Your life isn't a letter that is written on a tablet with a pen. Your life is a letter that is written on the tablet of the human heart. Go and be part of someone's molten moment. It might take place in Sunday school. It might take place on a ball field, in a grocery store, over a cup of coffee, on an airplane, at a bus stop, over your fence in your backyard. But anticipate it. Look for them. Pray for them. Pray for those molten moments. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do whatever it takes to reach other people for Jesus Christ because, well, it just makes sense. Amen. 